Good evening, my name is Arlene Hurston. The name of the show is Getting to Know You, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Tonight, we're going to get to know a champion, that very special kind of person who excels in everything he does. In sports, he excelled as the World Karate Champion and retired undefeated. In films, he excels at the box office where his motion pictures have grossed over $200 million. In life, he excels as one of the most considerate, warm, and likable human beings that I have ever met. Truly a champion. He is Chuck Norris, and let's get to know him. Welcome. Hi, Arlene. How are you doing? Hi. Okay. <laughs> you have a new look. You're still a champion. You're always going to yeah, be a champion yeah. to me, but a new look. You yes. know, why? You have a beard now. Yeah, I do. Why the beard? Well, when I decided, you know, when Lone Wolf McQuaid came about to, to be a movie, the director says, well, what do you think about wearing a beard? And I went, geez, I've never worn a beard in my life. A mustache is the most I've ever had on my face. I said, I don't know, you know, and he said, well, why don't you grow one and then we'll take a look at it and decide, and so I did, and we wound up shooting Lone Wolf McQuaid as a, with the beard. Okay, and how does Chuck Norris feel about the beard? Are you comfortable with it? I am now. Yeah. <laughs> I like okay. it now. You know, it's something, you, it kind of grows on you to, <laughs> to use a pun, I guess, but uh, no, I, I do like it. I do like it. I, I, I like it on the screen. And I'll probably wear it in my other movies, too. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, we, we won't hold you to that. All right, it's please, don't do that, Arlie. Okay. <laughs> okay, you mentioned Lone, Lone Wolf McQuaid, and that's your uh, new movie, mm -hmm. uh, where your character is a little bit different from the characters in other Chuck Norris movies. How is this different for you? Well, McQuaid isn't quite as a passive individual as the characters I've played in the past films. The uh, characters in, in my previous films are types that were pushed, 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 pushed to the point where you say, my gosh, will you do something, you know? Well, McQuaid is, is more of a reactionary type actor. He, or a person rather, where if he's pushed, he immediately pushes back twice as hard. And I like him. He's kind of a last of a breed. He's a, a guy who would fit in r very well in the 1800s, you know, <laughs> but yet he fits in well in the 1980s. He's the type of person who is obsessed with accomplishing whatever he sets his mind to, at doing. And, and of course, in this particular instance, it's uh, law enforcement. And he's obsessed with the idea of, of, even if he has to stretch the law a little bit, he will, uh, he will go after his man and, 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 and do whatever it is he does to get him. Right, okay, well, as a matter of fact, a little bit later on, we're gonna see Lone Wolf McQuaid. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see okay. you as Lone Wolf McQuaid, and a little clip of it. But um, in your movies, you have become truly a hero to millions of teenagers. Uh, do you feel that you have an obligation to maintain a certain image being a hero? Well, yeah, because being a karate instructor for 20 years, uh, you know, I always taught a certain philosophy, a philosophy that, you know, that to, you know, to excel in life, what it takes to be successful and happy in life is not by being rich, you know, people say, oh, gee, I want to be rich, but being rich does not guarantee happiness. I have a lot of friends that are rich that are very unhappy. The thing is, is doing what you enjoy doing and hopefully having someone to share it with. And if you're motivated at working at something you enjoy, the money will come automatically. It's the byproduct of what you do. Because the thing is, a third of your life deals in working. If you do something that you don't enjoy doing, then you're really wasting one third of your life. Okay, you're obviously not wasting your life because you're obviously... I, no, I enjoy it, Arlene. I enjoy the acting field. It's been a real challenge, boy. I tell you, it's... Uh, because, you know, when I first got into acting, and I did my first film as a star, I had very little experience. I mean, I knew nothing about acting. I had one year of acting classes, and all of a sudden, I'm starring in this film. Now, as a star of a movie, you're carrying 95 to 98 percent of the movie. You're in almost every scene. You have all your character actors that are taking up 10 percent, 15 percent of the movie, but you're having to carry the whole, almost the whole film. And that's tough for a person that's been in the field for 20, you know, for a long time. But for me, who hasn't been in there a long period of time, it was a real challenge for me. Okay, what was your first film? Well, the first real film was a movie called Breaker Breaker, but we shot that in three weeks. I knew absolutely nothing of what I was doing. 
But my real, I consider my first major film was Good Guys Wear Black. Okay, that, that's what, because I saw that. Uh -huh. And uh, you were terrific. I mean, well, I've seen Good Guys Wear Black. I'm glad you that. think so. <laughs> no, okay. I've seen Octagon, <laughs> I saw Force of One, um, and they were all terrific. And when you say that that was your first film and you had to carry it, yeah. you really did a sensational job. Well, for the, for the time I'd been at it, you know, uh, you know, because people say, well, wouldn't you have to go back and do it again? And I say, no, because that's as good as I was at that time in my life, in 1977. That's as good as I was as an actor. I couldn't have done any better. And now I've moved on to other films. Right, and getting better and better and better. And we're going to take a commercial break, and we're going to find out some of the other things that you've been doing. Okay. We're speaking with Chuck Norris, and we'll be right back after these messages. So stay right there. We're back with my very special guest, Chuck Norris. You, know, you had mentioned karate before. Of course, karate really is how it started yeah. for you. Um, how did that come into your life? Well, I went into the Air Force right out of high school in 1958 and uh, was sent to Korea. And while I was over there, I got my first experience of the martial arts and I started training over there. Came back to the States uh, as a black belt, got discharged from the service in 1962, and I started teaching and uh, decided to make it a full-time career. And I was trying to figure out how to get students in my school, so I decided to become a karate fighter. Okay. And, you know, the whole thing is that, like I tell kids today, is that, you know, my goal, you, goals are very important things that the kids have to do today. They have to set goals and, and, and know what direction they want to go with their lives. And, and that was basically what I was trying to do at that time, because I was still young. I was only 22. And I said, okay, uh, Chuck, if you can win a Los Angeles tournament, you can get a write up in the magazine, get students in your school. And, and so, uh, luckily, I won that, which moved my direction, my goal to a higher level of the state title, which I won in '65. That led into the national title in '66, to the international title in '67, to the world title right. in '68. Okay, you know, but it wasn't easy when you said you came back from Korea with your black belt. I understand that the teachers in Korea gave, particularly the American GIs, a very hard time. Um, to get your black belt degree in Korea must have really been a phenomenal thing. At that time. It's not so bad now, but in the uh, early 60s or late 50s and early 60s, um, they, there weren't that many GIs training over there. And the ones that did try, most of them didn't stick with it. So we got a reputation of not being able to stick with things. And uh, so when I first started, they, were, they thought, well, here's another one that's going to quit. And uh, so they didn't pay any particular attention to me until about the fourth month in the training. And, and the training over there was, was like five hours a day. But it's not motivating type training that we have over here where the instructors are able to motivate you to keep you going. Over there it's very routine. You do so many things for one hour, then you do so many things the second hour, and it's the same thing night, day in and day out. And boy, it's, it's hard to motivate yourself to come back and know exactly what you're gonna do from the next day. But I stuck with it and fortunately I... Yeah. Okay, you stuck with it and you mm -hmm. became a champion. And yeah. you've received many awards. I've been fortunate enough to be in your house in California where I saw a whole wall of awards. <laughs> but there's one in particular that I would like to read, and that's the inscription from the Black Belt Hall of Fame that was awarded to you in 1968. Actually, in 1979, you were their Man of the Year. But the inscription from the Black Belt Hall of Fame is very special because it tells us a lot about Chuck Norris, the person. And I'd like to read it. A man, and I'm quoting now, who has almost single-handedly built a respect of the highest character and achievement for the karate participant. Norris has won more tournament crowns than any other player, maintains an allegiance toward his students, a respect for his opponents, whether they win or lose to him. His ability and character knows no equal. Now that's true. <laughs> it's nice, it's true. Uh, does it embarrass you when people say such nice things about you? Well, yeah, I guess, yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> okay, because everybody says <laughs> yeah, nice things, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but they're true. I mean, it's right? nice that they think that. It's, it's very nice that they, they feel that way, that they can express it that way. Yeah, it's very nice. okay, and it's true. But you have, I read in a magazine recently, in one of the Black Belt magazines, that you consider yourself a very gullible person. You trust people until they prove it otherwise. Has that proved to be a good philosophy for you? Oh, I, do. I believe it is. I, uh, I wouldn't want to have it any other way. I, um, I'd hate to be we are going around always suspicious. You know, people say, well, how do you know who your friends are? When you, became, when you become famous, how do you know they're not just hanger-oners? 
And I said, well, I really don't think about that. I don't really worry about it. If I enjoy the company of the people I'm with, I don't care what their motivation is, as long mm -hmm. as I enjoy it. And, and that's the way I feel. And you haven't been hurt by it? No, of course not. No. Yeah, okay, good. You told me you were shy when you were younger. You're not shy now. Uh, how did you get over that? Well, I am. I mean, but I've been at it so long that I'm able to control the shyness. But by nature, I'm still a shy person. But, you know, being in the, in the entertainment field from karate to uh, films, you can't be in a shell. So you have to work at not being but, uh, but by nature, I still am. Is it tough to be in the public eye? Does it change your life a lot? No, it hasn't changed it uh, in any dramatic sense. I, uh, I enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. You know? yeah. But uh, it's a challenge for me, and that's, that's what life's all about, because that's what makes life exciting. It's challenges, you know, and can I do it, you know, and that motivation of overcoming the different obstacles that you've got to encounter toward whatever it is that you're working toward. And once you overcome an obstacle, you say, man, I did it, you know. <laughs> then all of a sudden, here's another one. You go, <laughs> so you had to plug away again. But, and then as you overcome those, though, it, it's an excitement that you just can't get anywhere else. Uh -huh. Okay, there's an obstacle I can't overcome. Now we have to take a commercial break. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're speaking with Chuck Norris, and we'll be right back after these messages. We're back with my guest, Chuck Norris. You married your high school sweetheart, mm -hmm. a lovely lady that I've gotten to know yeah. too, uh, Diane. Right. Um, I read someplace that you said that the two strongest forces in your life, besides God, were your mother and your wife. Can you share what you meant by that? Well, what I meant is that growing up as a child, you know, fortunately I had a mother. I, I didn't have a father, you know, to uh, give me the certain guidance that I needed. But I was very lucky to have a mother who instilled in me the, the things that I needed. Uh, you know the respect and, and the honesty and and, um, and your, your belief and your faith. Uh, and then when I left home, then I got married. I was very fortunate to find a, a young lady uh, that was able to give me the encouragement and the uh, willingness to strive, without saying, "Well, why aren't you home?" You know, and, and giving you a lot of the negative stuff that sometimes can drain you of your energy. But like when I got out of the service. Now, because I, I married my wife, she was one month seventeen, oh, and I'm eighteen, right. right? And I go into the service, and I get out, and now I go to work at Northrop Aircraft, which is you know, and I'm working eight to five, and then I'm teaching karate from six to ten. Well, you know, that doesn't leave much time for home life. Plus, we've got a a, a, a young, small child, a baby, and my wife constantly encouraged me to keep pursuing whatever goals I had, and and through that encouragement, I was able to become relatively successful in the karate world and as, and as well as, as a competitor. Like many times I come to New York because I fought a lot in New York and we wouldn't have the money. I wouldn't have the money to come back here. But she would still say, well, yeah, go ahead and go back there and fight. Because when you fight back here, all you get is a trophy. You don't get money, uh -huh. but you, all you get is recognition. And so I'd come back here and I'd win a $20 trophy and I'd go back home. But, but because of that, it built a reputation that led me to what I am today. Yeah, terrific. And actually, you're very supportive of her. I have to put in a plug for Diane's new restaurant. Right, yeah, exactly. In California, yeah. Uh, Chuck Norris's wife, uh, and Diane, is opening a restaurant called Woody's Wharf. Mm -hmm. And if you're in California, go Newport to Woody's Beach. Wharf. Right. Newport Beach, okay. yeah. All right, you, uh, Diane has been very supportive of you, but I understand she's not too crazy about you doing love scenes in movies. And Lone Wolf McQuaid, you have a love scene, um, but uh, we're not going to show the love scene. We have another clip, <laughs> but the girl that you, that you kind of become involved with is in this right. scene. Can you set it up for us? Yeah, what it is, it's an opening scene that I go to a party that I've been invited to by Barbara Carrera. And Carradine is a European karate champion, and he's going to put on an exhibition with three karate fighters. And so we're th I'm there with her watching the fight in the ring, kickboxing. And after he knocks the three guys out, he kind of challenges me. How about coming in and going a couple rounds, and we'll put a little wager on it, you know, kind of embarrassing me in front of the crowd. And I say, no, I'm not interested in fighting. You know, I don't fight for money anyway. And everyone goes, oh, you know. Anyway, then uh, since he can't lure me into the ring to fight him, he decides what he'll do is send one of his uh, thugs over and create a fight with my partner, who's a Chicano boy, who's dancing with this girl. And he starts insulting the guy. And the guy hits him, 
but this guy's so big it doesn't do anything. And he, then the big guy nails uh, Kale and sends him flying. And then I, of course, then I intervene and I get into a fight with a lot of his, his uh, thugs there. And it leads into almost an altercation between David and I, but Barbara breaks it up so it doesn't start okay. there. Okay, well, we're going to take a look at it okay. right now. It's right over here on the monitor. I see we are graced with the presence of the media favorite, Ranger J.J. McQueen. Yeah. 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 Gonna go for one, Ranger? A little wager, perhaps? No thanks. I don't fight for money. Quit while you're ahead, partner. Who the hell asked you? Let me show you. Come on, tough guy. Join the fun? This is not my idea of fun! Please let me apologize. Some of my friends could learn a little manners. Maybe you need some new friends. Wow, that was quite a scene, you know, <laughs> to tell you, okay. But actually, you do fight David Carradine, right. ultimately, in yes. the end, in the final scene. Now, he complained about that after the movie was finished. What was his complaint? Well, I think he had second thoughts after the fight scene where, you know, we, I finally do beat him in the end. Uh, all of a sudden, he's thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, my, my followers of my Kung Fu series are going to think, well, you know, geez, Chuck is better than me. And, uh, and I may lose some prestige in that area. So all of a sudden, I'm getting calls from my uh, black belts all over the country saying, I just read an article in the paper that uh, David Carradine kicked you in the jaw and cracked your jaw. And uh, you didn't do anything about it. You just turned around and walked off. And I go, oh, really? <laughs> and then I, got, uh, then I heard that, oh, yeah. And plus, uh, uh, they, uh, he really beat you in the fight scene. But through the editing of the movie, uh, uh, they made you win. And, I, and so finally the news gets a hold of me, and they say, is this true, David Carradine did that, and David Carradine did this, and I said, look. I said, first of all, you know, I'm the star of the movie. I'm supposed to win. I'm a professional fighter, you know, for eight years. I said, you know, if he's having apprehensions or if he feels bad about this here, you know, I don't know what the answer is unless he just wants to fight, you know, and, uh, and if he can beat me, then he can be the champion. I don't know what other answer I can give you for that, you know, but, but the thing is that it's done, and, and he did a good job on the film, and he shouldn't have anything to complain about. Right, okay, and actually, he was the bad guy. I mean, you won legitimately, but you should have won, because we were all for you. Right. Just one quick question on the film. You're out in the desert in Texas uh, with rattlesnakes. I hear that a rattlesnake kind of came in at a very inconvenient moment. Yeah, it was very inconvenient. Yeah, Barbara and I were in the middle of a love scene. <laughs> it's not the best time to have a rattlesnake crawling around. And it was strange because uh, all of a sudden I heard, you know, Barbara and I were trying to get, you know, ready, you know, to uh, kiss. And uh, all of a sudden we hear all this commotion going on by our bed. And uh, so I roll over and here's this five-foot rattlesnake crawling all over the place. And uh, this Indian guy that was on the set caught it. And he killed the snake, and he, and he peeled the, the skin right off the snake. Wow. And he made a belt out of it, and he ate the snake. 
Wrong. Oh my, oh my goodness. <laughs> I swear he did. Oh I was goodness. like, I guess that thing just starts gobbling on. I go, jeez. <laughs> wow. And okay. then I had to go back to the love scene after that. <laughs> <laughs> While I recover, we're going to take another break. We're speaking with Chuck Norris, and we'll be back in just a minute. We're back with my very special guest, Chuck Norris. Uh, aside from being a movie star and a karate champion and a teacher, you're also a pinup. You appeared in Playboy magazine. Now, well. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to open up to the pictures uh, that were taken actually by uh, John Zimmerman, who did a superb job. Yeah, he did do a good job on the photographs. I will tell you that Chuck Norris has his clothes on. Okay, oh, right. but you're in Playboy mm -hmm. here. How did this come about? Well, they called up one time and they said uh, Hugh Hefner, you know, has a special line of, of uh, a wardrobe, and we'd like for you to. Uh, demonstrate them on, on Playboy. When they first called up, they said, we'd like to have you on Playboy. I go, hey, I'm not going to do anything nude, you know, and they said, well, Playboy's for girls, the nude, you know, this is just a thing to demonstrate some of the wardrobe that he has, but in a martial arts sense. And so they brought all these robes and pajamas and all this stuff down here, and so I spent 12 hours doing kicks in all these different robes that Hefner has, and I'm surprised it turned out quite well. Yeah, actually, they turned out terrific, mm -hmm. uh, but how do you feel about being a Playboy? Well, I don't mind Playboy. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> okay. I won't say I don't. <laughs> well, in my house, we bought this as you only because you own it. <laughs> okay. okay, we have another book, a different kind of book, actually, uh, that you've written uh, called uh, Toughen Up yeah. with uh, Chuck Norris. Uh, this is hot off the press. It's not even released yet. No, not till next month. It's really Tell amazing about, about this book. You know, Ben, I've heard that when I'm on the road, you know, traveling like I am here, that I had to modify my workout because at home, you know, as you know, I have a gym and I go through a regimen of training, as your son Mike knows too, because he worked <laughs> out with me. But I, uh, but on the road, I had to modify it. So what I did is I incorporated various systems of exercising, stretching, which is very important, a lot of aerobic, uh, isometric, isotonic type exercises, and incorporated uh, a system of, of routine that will keep me flexible, keep my body toned, and, and my cardiovascular system up. It's almost like as a karate fighter. You know, I first was a Korean stylist. I said, well, geez, yeah, but I can't use my hands very well because the Korean system is all kicks. So I studied the Jap Japanese system, which emphasized hands. I studied the Chinese system, which worked on the fluidity of your movements. And that was the reason I won it, what I did win. And I've done the same thing with my exercise book. I've incorporated, I think, the best of each exercise program into a singleized workout you know, program there. Okay, how do you find the time? You travel all over the world promoting your films. You've now finished your eighth film. You've written a book. Uh, you still take your spare time and donate it, uh, giving karate demonstrations to boys clubs and judging karate contests. How do you fit it all in? Oh, I guess the regimentation of time, I guess, is the only thing. You know, you just, you, you have to program your time and be, you know, I guess the, that's the key thing. And just making sure that you use the time the best of your ability. Because I hate to be bored. I hate to be not doing something productive. You know, I want to, you know, because life is too short to be sitting around doing nothing and letting your mind, you know, get the blahs. So I, uh, I try to program as much as I can yeah, into it. You sure do. Okay. And in the last 30 seconds, what are your ambitions for Chuck Norris? To keep making better movies, I hope, you know, and to keep growing as an actor. And each film I do, I hope, is better than the one before. Lone Wolf McQuaid, I think, is by far the best film I've done. You've seen it. And okay. I enjoy it immensely. It's the only movie I've seen half a dozen times. I've seen it six times. And I still haven't gotten bored with Lone Wolf. My other films, I can't, I can't stand to see them anymore. But uh, Lone Wolf, I've really enjoyed seeing it over and over again. Yeah, I enjoyed it. But the best part for me was seeing you in it. And even better is having you here on my show. And I thank you very much for being here. My pleasure, Arlene. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to know Chuck Norris. I know that I certainly have, and that you'll join us again next week. Meantime, good night. It's been a pleasure getting to know you.